and upset. And, you know, I think that's that's perfectly understandable. <clears throat> but I did want to, um, I did want to kind of uh, go over a couple of things that, you know, I've had a couple days to sleep on. Um, <clears throat> got a little bit of writing done that's Final Fantasy related. Hopefully have that up soon. Um, but, uh, but I did want to kind of break down the Endwalker launch trailer. Um, you know, my live reaction, it was still just kind of processing everything. Obviously, everything was a Japanese, so didn't really get to uh, get to understand the voices and all of that. Um, so a lot of stuff to kind of go over. And um, I figured we'd go ahead and start the stream before I start leveling up and, and all of that uh, on my machine. Let's go ahead and do a breakdown of that. Now, obviously, there's going to be spoilers and whatnot, so... If you haven't seen the launch trailer, if it's not something you're interested in seeing quite yet, uh, this is your warning. Please go do something else. Um, we'll be back to leveling machinist here in just a little bit. Uh, so let me adjust everything here and um, and get the uh, get our um, a little thing up here. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be starting and stopping this. So I really kind of want to break down the trailer and, and give some of my thoughts on it and see what's going to happen here. Um, you know, a lot of it's a, a pretty big mystery up to this point, but um, but I think there's a couple of hints. Obviously, there's there's quite a quite a few places that could be you know kind of baiting us in one direction and and could go a completely other way. That's uh, that's something they've uh, done just about every launch trailer so far. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, and get on in here and and kind of kind of break it down a little bit here. <laughs> and of course, the music just right off the bat. <laughs> and so venture forth unto the unknown. Yeah. See, I didn't realize that was Emmett the first time that I watched it, and um, yeah, I think it's interesting that he's going to be our narrator. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to have him back, at least in some form. Have a safe journey, and please, please, be careful. So obviously I think this is us leaving for Old Charlayan and um, making our journey there. That which lives is destined to die. Love leads to loss. Every beginning has an end. Okay, so obviously we had Razad Han there and um and every all of the first beasts coming out. So I think at this point it's pretty clear to say that, you know, whatever had awakened the first beasts is going to be coming back in in the source. Um that's pretty clearly what Fandaniel and, and Xenos are kind of aiming for right now. Um trying to um trying to awaken whatever it was that was making that, you know, primordial calling that was referenced in Amarat. Um, so, you know, those flying things, everyone I've seen on, on reactions going, whoa, what is that? And I, I think I did that during the launch trailer too. Um, you know, if you go back and, and, and play Amaroth the Dungeon, those are the, the flying tentacle, tentacly dudes that are, uh, that are, um, in the final stretch. Um, so, so yeah, a lot of, a lot of first beasts coming back. Mm -hmm. It's just the volume a little bit here. That's where souls and stars rest. Find your truth. That wins towards the final days. And of course, referencing again, the final days are back upon us. Obviously, Garlemald and the uh, Tower of Zot. So I I've seen a lot of people just kind of reacting to this scene, not necessarily saying anything of it, but I think that this is something very, very important, not just story-wise, but uh, cinematography-wise. You know, Yoship had kind of referenced this quite a bit earlier, and, um, you know, saying that the Master QA, he was spending so much time worried about the story and the cutscenes. You know, it seems like every expansion, they've really ramped up the... Um, the scale and the uh, the quality of their storytelling and and, and in particular um really the cinematography in the game um you know this is one of those scenes that really stood out to me not just for the implication of what's going to happen to alpha Noah and alizé but uh just how much farther they've come along um at this point like endwalker does not to me feel like the completion of a video game it, it really feels like a 
we're watching the end of a movie that we've been watching for eight years at this point. Um, you know, even just the animations of her crawling on over was um, is something that we've never really seen before. I mean, I think that's a pretty significant jump up. I think now that they're away from a lot of the PlayStation limitations and, and more gearing themselves for the PS5 and uh, late PS4, uh, we're going to see a pretty big jump in quality. Um, there was already a pretty big jump in Shadowbringers with some of the stuff they were doing with the camera and some of the filters they were using during movement. Um, but I mean, this this scene in particular really does make it feel like a movie uh, rather than just a video game. And I think that's um, I think that's really what I'm looking forward to as much as as anything, seeing how far they've uh, they've come along on it. Um, so so yeah, pretty excited for it. The cold. Obviously, the net. I think that's that's pretty clear at this point. The uh, the voice of Heidelin, the heart of Heidelin. I mean, Vegas sisters. Yeah, Darvza. Now this is new. We hadn't really seen too much of uh, of that dungeon before. Of course, Anima. Now, Anima. I think is going to be really interesting. So we've had so many questions as far as what is going to happen as far as, you know, how are the first bees coming back? Uh, what was the creature that had, you know, originally called to everyone? Um, obviously, I think this is pretty clearly going to be a trial. I think this sequence right here is going to end up being an act of time maneuver. I think that's pretty obvious. At this point. Um, you know, when it comes to the creature that made, made the initial keening, as they called it, um you know i i know a lot of people myself included are like hey let us fight lavos that would be pretty cool and you know after the reveal of the islands that look incredibly like zeal a lot of people are kind of wondering if they might bring chrono trigger back you know i think that's kind of wishful thinking i would love it if it does end up being the curveball that they throw at us um realistically i don't think that's what's gonna happen um so so it kind of got me thinking just looking at everything that's going around with the, the art design and everything of the, of the background here, I'm kind of wondering, like, what if Anima is the one that was originally making the call to create the first piece? I mean, it kind of fits a little bit with um, with what I remember from Final Fantasy X. It's been a long time since I've played it, um, but um, but it does kind of fit. Uh, the art design and the style here fits along with what was going on in, in um, some of the other areas that we're going to see a little bit later, as well as the opening of the Pandemonium uh, raid. Um, I think, you know, if you look around here, this could very much be something that's maybe being, key, you know, hidden underneath Charlian. Uh, this could be their secret. Um, you know, I, I mentioned, I think maybe during the live letter, maybe it was just in Discord, but I kind of wonder if Labyrinthos, the, uh, the underground area that they keep showing off, might not be where they're excavating anima or whatever happens to be falling to the first beast. So I, I think anima might have a pretty significant part to play uh, in this expansion. Um, it really would not surprise me whatsoever if she was being, you know, chained underneath as being the original caller of the of the beast. So so we'll see. Mm -hmm. Or is in references? <laughs> Looks great. Burns. The final days are truly upon us. Or the first piece. Now, I thought this was interesting too. You know, it's more just like a, a callback, but that's obviously Foon Baba from Final Fantasy VI after the World of Ruin, and you have to have to recruit Terra. Um, Foon Baba, I don't know if this is just going to be like, you know, solo duty or something like that, but um, but I thought this was a great little reference of just kind of showing the scale of destruction that's going around since, you know, if you played VI, um, Foon Baba only shows up in the World of Ruin after everything's basically decimated. Um, it was originally supposed to be a, a, an incredibly hard boss. You weren't originally supposed to beat it until you've done a little bit more and then recruited Terra and then have her abilities come through. He basically one shots uh, one shots the party. Um, so we'll see what happens with, with Fumbaba running around, but I think that's a nice little reference just to kind of show the scale of the destruction that's going on down in Razet Han right now. Bereft of hope and now dignity. 
was a grand, glorious dream we shared. You know, I think, you know, just judging by the hairstyle, that might have been Nero. Um, but we don't know for sure. It's been a long time since I've heard his voice actor. I don't even know if he's had a voice actor since ARR. Um, so, um, so yeah, that should be pretty interesting. And it could not be Nero. I'm just, you know, it's hard to tell just judging by the hairstyle, but, um, I think that's kind of the, um, kind of the given. Nice, nice place to stop there. <laughs> I won't lose them. Not a one. But are we truly so powerless? That our only choice is to flee. Now, the blue-haired guy is going to be pretty interesting. You know, I've heard a couple of rumors going around. Could be a new character. Could be one of the, um, <clears throat> it could be one of the clones of Solus that now has to figure out how to be their own person. I think that could be an interesting story. Um, whoever it is, is is obviously going to be pretty important because they're shown here a couple of different times. Um, you know, I don't think they would do that if if this new character wasn't going to be pretty significant to to our journey. Um, I do think it, it, is, it is interesting, the parallels between having the blue-haired character and Emmett doing the narration. So uh, we'll just have to see how, how that comes up. I love the I love the design of the first beast too. A lot of people commenting how the Amaradines don't have masks, yeah. And of course, us on the on the throne. Uh, this is an interesting part, looking pretty defeated. You know, in pretty much any kind of of storytelling, especially when you're talking about the hero's journey, there's always a point where essentially the hero has lost everything, and that's kind of kind of their their lowest point. You know, there's always going to be ebbs and flows as the as the you know, stakes build and, you know, unresolved and build again. And it just kind of keeps rising like a ladder, right? Um, so I think this is this is at the point where where our hero is at their lowest. Um, we've lost everything. I'm kind of curious what that is going to entail. Um, and of course, Zeno's kind of clouding himself over us. Um, yeah. So so obviously, I think this is pretty much a point, a, a point of dejection. Or it could be us doing a faint. You know, that's another possibility, too. Maybe we have actually won, and at this point, you know, maybe the cost was too great or something like that, but that's also another possibility. We won, we're sitting on the throne, and now it's um, just kind of taunting Xenos to come to us. I don't think we would have our head bowed, but, you know, who knows? New zone, of course. It's either a new zone or a new dungeon, but very interesting. New boss we haven't seen yet. Looks like it could be from Pandemonium. I do love the flashbacks and just the build in the in the theme. I do think it is interesting that it it transitions to the old Charlayan theme here. There must be a way Convocation, to yeah. To the way they were. Now this, everyone's saying Zodiac, Zodiac, Zodiac. I don't necessarily think it's Zodiac. Um, it could be, um, but when you look at the design, and someone had mentioned this in, in one of my discords too, but it looks like Necros from Final Fantasy IX. I mean, the design and just about everything about it looks a lot like Necros. Supposedly there was a leak from the Square offices that had the picture of Necros uh, at the, at the, uh, on the walls. Um, so it could be possible that that is Fandaniel. Fandaniel could be Necros. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, it could be Zodiac. They could just be trying to do a callback in the design. That's something that they've done fairly fairly often. Zodiac, of course, has been a long time character in Final Fantasy as well. But um, but it'll be interesting to see what this is leading up to as far as like the final fight goes. And you know what what Fan Daniel's saying here is also pretty interesting because it sounds like he wants the rejoining just like the Unsundered did. Um, so. Yeah, I think Zeppelin had mentioned this as well, but you know, are they are they doing a bait and switch with Fandane? You know, I've I've had a, a, a lot of people um discussing Xenos as a villain and Fandaniel as a villain and whatnot. Um, you know, Fandaniel is really the main villain. Um, you know, a lot of people don't like Xenos, they think he's too campy or, or you know, just kind of too one note. You know, Xenos and, and this is fairly common in a lot of different kind of storytellings. You've got kind of an A plot and a B plot kind of going at the same time, right? You know, the way that a villain is is portrayed is not necessarily, 
you know, where their themes and motifs come from, right? So Xenos is portrayed as just a, a very deadly, intimidating villain. So naturally, people would necessarily think that, you know, oh, he's the serious villain and Van Daniel's ooh, the old crazy one like the Joker, right? Um, but that, when you look at the themes and when you look at, you know, the actual plot progression, that's not necessarily the case. Like Xenos, I love Xenos because even though he's portrayed very seriously and campy, and whatnot and he's obviously going to have a very big role in whatever is going to happen xenos is really the campy villain you know that's why he's so one note there's not a whole lot of progression that happens with xenos uh even changing jobs and whatnot i don't anticipate that his mindset or his motivations are going to change all that, right uh fan daniel however i think is really really the serious one the one that where a lot of the themes and a lot of the story progression is going to come from. So even though he is portrayed almost as like a Kefka-esque villain, um, he's really where the story is centered around. He's the he's the the serious motivation for the story. Um, so so yeah, I think that's going to be interesting to see his motivations and and see what exactly his plan is coming through the course of Endwalker. Um, and why I like them both, um, you know, despite their outward presentations, when you dig into their motivations and you dig into their progression themes, um, and you kind of see, you know, where they actually fall on that scale of can't be this serious, I think um, they're a lot more interesting than people kind of give them credit for you. You know, Xenos, you, you can't really take it at face value, or, or I should say you can take it face value. You know, he's supposed to be kind of the one no one. But Van Daniel, whatever Van Daniel's doing is obviously pretty interesting and, and has a lot of implications here. Um, but yeah, as far as the final fight, you know, we'll see if this ends up being Zodiac and Necros. Um, you know, just the scale of everything and the fact that we've got the Amarok teams around us could be the summoning of, the, of, of Zodiac. But, you know, we'll, uh, we'll have to see. I think it is an interesting, um, interesting callback to FF9, though, as far as the design goes. To reclaim yeah. the perfect paradise we once had. Mm -hmm. It will be ours again. I think this is also really cool too. Sorry for stopping a whole lot, but obviously the you know I did the reaction earlier. This I really want to break it down. Um the Asians as their masks come up, I think it's interesting because I don't feel like they're against us anymore. Like, they're looking around, they're looking to us, we're looking up at them, and then immediately it goes into the summoning of, you know, the Grahatia had, had placed for us. Uh, we're summoning through the heart of his M, you know, our, our fellow warriors of light, uh, immediately after that scene. I, I think that is, I think that's going to be pretty interesting to see play out. Like, it, it really does feel like whatever troubles the Asians had with us before, it feels to me like they are no longer against us. Whatever Fan Daniel is playing, playing at, like they're no longer for it. You know, we have destroyed almost all of the Unsundered. They're no longer tempered at this point. You know, Emmett Selk is narrating at the beginning w uh, with us, like he considers himself, you know, one of our friends now. So I think that it is interesting that it looks as though the Warrior of Light is now the one carrying the torch for the Asians. Um, I really, whenever I first saw this and, and looking back at it now, I really do not feel like the masks coming up around us were against us at all. I don't get that feeling just from the way the trailer and the music is playing out. It really does feel like um, like we're carrying their torches. So um, we'll uh, we'll see, see what happens there. <laughs> a world free of sorrow. Of course, Fortuno obviously knows something going on upon this the final chapter in the tale of the star the um, daddy levio knows something and could be tempered himself we'll see and then of course the stinger that has everyone super worried <laughs> It could be bait. To me than you, know. you know, I think there was a launch trailer, was it for Heaven's Thank Word, you. that shows, um... From the bottom of my heart, given what lies ahead, I did not wish to leave for later that which I could do Please today. Say. Um, but yeah, I think it was, um... Let me go ahead and turn that off. Yeah, I think it was uh, the Heaven's Word trailer that had, um... 
that had Sid getting shot and everyone was super worried about it. So, I mean, they're known for bait and switching at the in the stingers of um, of their launch trailers. So we'll have to see what happens there. I don't think all of the all of the scions are going to make it. Um, but I don't know if it's necessarily going to be going to be alpha. No, you know, a lot of people are worried about Yashtola. Um, I don't necessarily think Yashtola is going to go away. You know, part of me is worried because we know that she is dying every time that she gets her Aether Sight. Um, so that's obviously pretty significant. But just from a practical standpoint, and, and this is part of me just having written about the industry for so long, you know, I don't think the PR department would let them get rid of Yashtola. I mean, they just got done making a thousand dollar doll of her. She's essentially the you know the the mascot for for ff14 i just don't think from a practical marketing standpoint they would let her go but you know who knows final fantasy games are known for bittersweet endings sometimes so it is entirely possible she could be one um i wouldn't be surprised if Uri urianje and thankrid are going to be gone i don't necessarily think all of the scions will die per se but you know their stories are told urianje and and thankrid i feel like their stories are you know, they they really ended with with Endwalker. Whatever happens, it's it's entirely possible that they could go back to the first and and hang out with Reen. You know, I think of all of the Scions whose stories are mostly told, I think it would be them. Raha's too new. I don't think Raha would necessarily be going away, but you know, obviously with um um with uh, Jonathan Bailey's work with Bridgerton, I mean, he's probably the biggest biggest voice actor in the cast at this point it wouldn't surprise me if maybe they have to find a way to get rid of graha just again from a practical standpoint that he is now too big of an actor to really be able to afford um or just simply doesn't have the time i mean he's in the middle of filming season two of bridgerton right now and he's the main character so you know trying to fit that in and and do endwalker i don't know how in the world how in the world he was able to do it um so so i wouldn't be surprised if graha is kind of you know tampered down in terms of um in terms of involvement um but yeah i think of all the scions i think Arianja and thankrid are the most likely to leave but you know it's possible they'll keep everyone around and they just won't have as big of a role with us as friends as they did before um could be a case where you know they come back every now and then be like hey you know how's it going haven't seen you in a while but um you know we might have to find a new party of adventurers you know if uh if the scions are no longer needed then you know uh it's time to move on to other things now as far as where we could go afterwards um you know there's uh there's a lot of potential you know there's still a whole other continent we haven't visited that um you know that's um you know the old world uh that originally uh, settled aorzea i think that was like the homeland of the rose and whatnot so that's uh that's some potential there and going pop into leveling duty roulette there um it could be possible that the rejoining actually goes through but not in the way that the Asians thought so i mean that's another possibility and um the world that we come through post end walker is completely different who knows um you know, with the island sanctuaries and everything coming back, you know, they said that they wouldn't mind kind of toning down the stakes post end Walker. I mean, it took them what, five expansions to uh, to build up to this point. So, yeah, uh, whatever they're going to be doing next, uh, I don't think is necessarily going to be like as super hard hitting. I'm not necessarily. I don't necessarily think we're going to have like a mass rejoining time skip again, maybe. You know, that's always a, a good fallback. Um, but I think whatever happens post-Endwalker isn't necessarily going to be all that world-shattering because we're going to have violent sanctuaries. It's supposed to be chill. It's the start of a new adventure. I think if they did do something like the uh, like the rejoining actually going through, the stakes would just be way too high. It'd be way too different um, to uh, to really start a new story from there. I mean, that's, that's pretty massive. Um... But, you know, we'll just have to come and, and, and take it as it comes, see what happens. Um, but yeah, there's a lot.